Hello, everyone. My name is Al Mora, and I am the host of the Get More Alpha Show and the host of the Investment Universe Seminars. This is my third Get More Alpha Show. Welcome if you've been here before. Welcome if you haven't. Um, today, we are going to learn some great stuff, including new stuff that I'm just learning. I just learned new things about cryptocurrency and alternative exchange traded funds, ETFs, that I'm going to share with you. So just before we get into that, I want to get our trading faces on because we're going to learn this stuff. We're going to lead the investment revolution. We're going to do it looking like this. Knowing what we're doing, we're gonna go, not going to go in there wondering what's going on, wondering what people are talking about and wondering what to do. We're going to have a fundamental sense of what's going on in the world so that, yes, we might go for, for advice for someone, but when they give us advice, we might actually understand what they're talking about. So let's get right into it. So today's presentation is investment types and optimal portfolios. Let me full screen it. Always a fun step. I will check my monitor. To confirm we are on full screen and we are about five or ten seconds uh we have about five or ten seconds of latency but it's looking good right now looks like we're going to get there and we are okay all right we are full screen and here we go so let's get into this i love sharing images of carlsbad and i have other neat images of the market and some new things that i tried this uh for this presentation to keep it you know fun and interesting and a little bit unpredictable uh, this part's not too unpredictable, except that it's always beautiful. You can never tire of looking at beautiful Carlsbad, California. And this show is being broadcast from one mile from that beach that you see in that photo right there. All right. So this is Alpha Lesson, first quarter of 2020, uh, lesson number two, investment types and optimal portfolios. Today is February 24, 2020. I am your host. There's a look at the New York Stock Exchange. All right. Here's our roadmap or our agenda for the day. I'm going to go back over the fact that we're in the middle of an investing revolution. We really are. And there's an irony because we're in a at a point where I'm extremely excited to get everyone involved in investing that I can. At the other hand, I we are at a point where I want to caution people more than ever because the markets right now are at very high highs. And today they had a tough day. They're down 3% today um, because they're at sky highs and because we have coronavirus and other things going on. So... We have an investing revolution. Let's get excited, but let's not get crazy. Let's not assume it's easy to go in there and just invest and you just make money automatically. It takes some real thought to be a, well, pardon me, redundancy, a thoughtful uh, investor. Okay, so and I'm going to do an S&P 500 uh, re index recaution. So there it is. The first one is, yay, time to invest. The second one is, but let's be careful. Okay, I have a little perspective slide for us, for Americans, when we think about capital markets. Um, and I think it's going to help us also get the sense of the size of everything today because it's a look at the size of our whole economy and how big our capital markets are. Okay. Uh, we're going to get into investment types and how much money they make and how risky they are. And then we're going to get into optimal portfolios, which is an entire graduate course. So you can get a thesis, you can get a PhD in optimal portfolios. People do that. People want the Nobel Prize for, for the system that I'm going to show you. I'm going to show it to you in one or two slides. Uh, so we're going to cheat and just like ride the camel's back, take advantage of the work of the people who came before us. But there are some really profound and I think intuitive, understandable insights that we get from looking at the optimal portfolio. Um, uh, uh, what do we call it? A um, slide that I have for you. So here we go. This is a slide from my first show. We are in the middle of an investment investing revolution. Let's look at the left again. We have busted a, roll, a hole through the wall that used to exist by brokers. Because look at the bottom two items. We have zero commissions now and no minimum balance. You can have a small amount of money to invest and you can open an account and you can have access to things that no one had access before, uh, access to before unless they had very large portfolios or unless they were institutional uh, actors or traders. So if we look at the top left corner, we have state-of-the-art interfaces that used to cost thousands, even millions of dollars to equip a team and now you have it for free when you open an online account you get good pricing now that you never had available before uh there is broker industry consolidation meaning they are fighting these online platforms are fighting for your business and they keep improving what they offer in every which way you can imagine uh and they're buying each other we'll get a tiny bit of that too um we have global market integration meaning now when you invest you can invest uh, all over the world 24 7 just about the whole week and you can even if you are up for it 
And if you have the right training and background, you can even do high speed algorithmic trading with these platforms, something that there's no way I could have imagined we could have by now. So here it is. The day of online investing is has dawned zero minimum balance, zero transaction commissions. We have free robo investment management now. So you're paying an investment manager 2%. This thing does it for free. It either interviews you or it gives you portfolios to pick from, and they could be doing the same work that your investment manager is doing. Uh, you can get at, at this through your computer, your tablet, your phone app, and there's much more. We don't have time. We could go, we could just focus on this all day, just platforms. Um, we will in the future, but today's not the day for that. And just so you know, this is not fly by night parties who are creating these platforms. These are the top brokers of all time. This is Charles Schwab, TD Ameritrade. Schwab is buying TD Ameritrade. So we have a slash, Charles Schwab slash TD Ameritrade. We have Fidelity, Interactive Brokers, Merrill Lynch, Morgan Stanley, who just announced last week, they're buying E-Trade. Okay. All right. So now here we go. S&P 500 ratio, recaution. Okay. The ratio is around 25. Now today we were down 3% and I did the math. I think the, the 25 times PE ratio is now around 23. I didn't whip out the calculator. I just checked it just before the show started. And I still, it's still, as you'll see on the charts, very, very high. Okay. So here we go. Here's where we are. Let's look at these red, the red button that turned on. That's where we are. That line shows us that we're about 25 times, just a little lower today. The average is 17 times. Look at that red line. That's 17 times. And you see it extending out to the uh, extreme left, telling us it's 17 times. And we've only been above 25 seven times, okay, out of whatever that is, 85, 92 years, 93 years, okay? And then 85 times, that's the right bracket, we've been under this level, all right? So right off the bat, to me, there's a higher chance the market will fall than it will uh, stay flat or it will rise, right? Now, in uh, last week's show, we went into this in detail, and we tried to see if we can sustain higher PE ratios. We concluded no. We're not going to get into any of that detail today. We're just going to remind ourselves that we still believe this. PE ratios are too high. The modern economy can't sustain 25 times. We might be able to maybe sustain better than the historical average of 17 times. But if we fell from, say, 25 to 20, that would be a 20% drop in the market. So look at your stock portfolio, all right? Divided by five, that's 20%. And that's what you will lose if you drop, if PE ratios drop from 25 only to 20, not down to the average, okay? So there's risk. And I know people personally who have been calling me, talking to me. I've had coffee. I've had lunch with people. And they're asking me and people are moving and they're adjusting their portfolios. Now, please don't just do it because I say so. Please ask people you trust. Ask people you know. If you don't know me, don't trust me. <laughs> Talk to people you trust and then make a decision. I will say friends of mine did exactly that. They had lunch with me and they went back to their investment managers and then they made a decision. And that is the way I recommend you always do it in anything in life. Just like seeing a doctor for, for an operation. Second opinion is so valuable. Here's our perspective. All right, Americans, drum roll. Don't try to decipher the table yet because I'm going to walk you through each line of the table. But let's look at what the table contains. On the top two columns, it has the U.S. and the rest of the world. Okay. And then it has lines. What is our population, rest of the world? What is our GDP? How much do we produce as a whole economy, that's the size of our economy. That's all the money that we make in a year, okay? And how much do we make per person? And our market capitalization is all the stocks that are outstanding on our uh, markets, okay? And then how much market cap do we have per person? All the bonds outstanding. We're going to talk a lot about bonds today because in investing, stocks and bonds are the t two critical tools that you're going to see why today are, frankly, they're the only tools that are in the optimal, they're in the optimal portfolio model. That's all you need. Uh, so anyway, then we can look at per person. Here we go, one line at a time. One in 25 humans lives in the U.S., okay? So we're not some big giant company, excuse me, country. We're not easy weensy but one in 25 is certainly not a majority, okay? Think, consider yourself lucky. One in 25 people are in this country, and it may not be perfect. It may not be your what you think is the best, but I love this country, and this is where I want to live, and that is why I live here, all right? This is where I was born. My children were born. This is where we have our hopes, okay? Uh, in spite of how difficult it is, hey, isn't family difficult? Aren't relationships difficult? Wasn't school difficult? Life is not easy, all right? So democracy is tough, but it is about freedom. All right, so here we go. Americans are eight times what the rest of the world earns on average. Look at the line, GDP and then per person. $65,000 per person in the US with 20 trillion GDP. 60 trillion for the rest of the world, but only 8,000 per person, okay? We're making eight times the average. So look around you. You have eight times more stuff on average. Okay. Um, 
Market capitalization, our stocks are worth 15 times more than the rest of the world per person. Okay, They're not worth more than the rest of the world in total. We have 30 trillion. The rest of the world has 40 trillion. But but when you count it per person, we have $100,000 worth of stock value, more or less, whereas the rest of the world has 6,000 worth of stock value. That number, those numbers went down a little today. We maybe have 97 because we went down 3% today. Okay. All right. Uh, bonds outstanding, same idea, $125,000 per person of bonds outstanding, only 8000 for the rest of the world. Why? Because we have better credit, because we can be relied upon to pay our bills, because we can issue a bond as a, as a government or as uh, companies and investors around the world have seen the pattern that we pay the interest, we pay the bonds when they mature. That is why we are more in debt. That is not necessarily bad. It's bad when it's overdone. And right now, it's kind of high. It's, we're cooking kind of hot, but it's not where it's cramming us and jamming our uh, economy. And in fact, during World War II, our debt was higher, quite a bit higher than it is now relative to the size of our economy. All right. So these numbers are all very rounded numbers and they are uh, they come from 27 and 2018. I don't have updates for these from 2019. If I put up a new table, I would be willing to bet some money. They'll be very similar to what we see here in terms of our relationship to the rest of the world. So what's the message here? The perspective is our massive capital markets, excuse me, today the Water cup is on the table. <laughs> our, our capital markets are the engine of the world economy. I got I have a tiny, the beginning or the end of a mini cold. Because last night I, I had a tiny cold. I felt better today. Here we go. I'm not no meds right now. I feel pretty good. Slightly stuffy. All right, roadmap today. We're gonna. We've already gone through the first three first three uh, points on the roadmap: investing revolution, S and P 500 index recaution, and perspective. Let's get into investment types. This is the heart of this presentation. We're going to get into some detail here, but not it's nitty gritty detail. But it's I'm going to call it administrative detail. It's not mathematical, hard to understand detail. Not at all. Okay, and um, here we go. Investment types. So for fun, here are some images that represent investment types. We've got a ticket there. That last one that popped up, I'll pop it up again. That's a trade ticket. That's Bitcoin. And there, that's a trade ticket that just popped up uh, on a futures exchange. Uh, I, they, you fill them out by hand, so they don't look so neat and pretty. But I found an image online, and I like that. And we see some stocks and some bonds, and we see gold. I didn't do anything about gold today. Uh, I, I intended to, but I didn't get to it. That's no worry. I'll get to it eventually. Uh, but I have a lot about bonds. I've got some stuff about indexes, ETFs, derivatives, and then the new one, alternative ETFs. Really exciting, really interesting. Here's an old image, beautiful image of the New York Stock Exchange. Really, I don't, I didn't figure out what year this was. We can imagine looking at somebody pulling a ticker that it's not just in the prior century, but the century before. This could be 19th, not 20th century, or very early 19th century. I would think maybe early 19th century because they have this, I'm thinking they had a uh, telegram in order to make this ticker work. Okay. So a share of stock, here we go. Stock is gonna end up being the fundamental most important uh, uh, investment and it's simpler than bonds. So we start with stocks, but it'll turn out, you'll see bonds are just as important as stocks, especially when we learn about optimal portfolios, okay? A share of stock is a security. And the only two things mainly we think about securities are stocks and bonds and a few other things. Um, but here we go, a stock is a security, a company issues it and whoever buys it owns a little part of the company, okay? So if we had 100 shares outstanding, one share would equal 1% ownership of the of the company. Now, this could be 100 million shares outstanding, and 1 million shares would be 1% ownership. Companies pay out profits via dividends, but they only pay typically about a third of their profit as dividends, and they keep the rest. They put it back into the business. Many companies don't pay any dividends. Some companies pay really high dividends. I'll say this really quickly about high dividend stocks. When the markets go down, high dividend stocks on average go down less than low dividend stocks, okay? All right, doesn't mean that, that I'm saying that's always gonna work. This is on average kind of stuff, but it's quite unpredictable. But it makes sense that whoever is taking their profits and handing them to you, seems like a safer bet than somebody who's just putting the money back into the company, hoping to build it more and hoping to make it grow faster in the future. The guy who's giving you their dividends already is comfortable that they have the earnings power to pay you that dividend and to keep their company going. And in general, they are stronger companies who who uh, pay dividends. All right, preferred stock, which is rarely used, and you won't hear any more, I think, today about it, is a, a kind of a, a stock that's senior, meaning they get their dividends first, okay? Let's see what I say about preferred here. Yeah, so here we go. When you buy preferred stock, your dividend is guaranteed, like kind of like an interest rate on a bond, and no common stockholder, that's all the other stockholders, 
uh, gets any dividends until preferred stock is caught up. So if preferred stock got behind, they get to ca get caught up. But here's something very important different between preferred stock and bonds, okay? In a preferred stock, if you get behind, you're not punished. There's nothing wrong. The price of the preferred stock probably will go down. But if you get behind on dividends, you have no obligation to pay the dividends. The obligation you have is to pay dividends to them before you pay dividends to uh, common stockholders, all right? Okay, and preferred owners sometimes have more voting power than common, and here's why. Sometimes companies that were owned by a person or a family that still want to retain a lot of power will create preferred stock before they go public, and that preferred stock will have super voting power, like 10 times more voting power than the other shares, and that makes a preferred share of stock more valuable, and it makes the common shares of stock less valuable, and they do that very aware that when they're selling the common stock, because they've retained a lot of power, they've made their common stock less valuable, and they're going to get less money when they sell their common stock, and they're willing to do that. Okay. So here we go. We're still on stocks. The value of a company's outstanding stock is the company's value. We call it market capitalization. Okay. Market capitalization. So um, the value of an operating company comes from all expected earnings. So if you have a share and you look at its value, that really is encasing all the expected earnings, all the earnings into the future forever that, ex that are expected to happen, that are expected to be uh, created by this company, that's what gives it stock value, okay? Now, if a company is not operating, okay, they're not profitable anymore, they could have value. They could have value because they might have assets, they might have cash, a lot of cash. So here's a company that may have a lot of cash, but they weren't really able to make their little restaurant make money. We had a lot of cash in the bank, and so the restaurant's going to have no profit, so they're going to shut it down or sell it. But if you buy that restaurant, they could sell you the, the accounts of the restaurant, well, then you, you'd get that cash, so it would have some value. But you would subtract all the money that restaurant owes before you get to touch that cash. That's why it's asset minus, li minus liabilities. All right. Here's the uh, oh, the stock owner's upside. The reason we buy stock. Stock is perpetual. Stock doesn't mature. And so is a preferred stock. So, and on average, stock makes 10% return. That's a combination of what you make by selling it after its price goes up and what you receive in dividends. Okay. And stocks are extremely easy to buy and sell. They're liquid, especially now that we have online investing platforms that you can get into, again, with no minimum balance and no commissions. All right. Uh, the downside to owning stock is you could have losses. The stock could go down if the company looks like they're going to start making less money. And it's as simple as this. A stock's value is impacted by changes in the company's prospects. So let's say a company uh, has kind of poor prospects and they get worse while well, the stock goes down, but if it has poor prospects, but it's still out there with a cheap, you know, $5 price, if the prospects improve, then it'll go up. So uh, prospects, what we expect to happen in the future is the dominant force in the price of a stock, okay? Um, but the risk we have is that we might lose money. And here's what a risk we have. Self-interested management. Managers can run the company in a way to where they pay themselves, say, very well, right? CEO can pay himself massively. And now the earnings of the company are less because he's earning more. And I'm the stockholder and I'm being hurt by that. So people are concerned because stock uh, CEOs now earn, I think, many multiples, 10, 20, 60, 100, 200 times the average employee. So there's a concern about that. Uh, it's hard to argue, though, that they're overpaid. Okay, But that's a theme for another, for another uh, day. We're not going to get into that. But here we go. The issuer's upside. Now, here is the issuer, the company that sells stock. They sell that stock and it's perpetual. So both sides like that it's perpetual, meaning you can form a company and it's not just in the hands of people who will leave planet Earth and then the company ends. Because it's perpetual, okay, they begin to build a company of a nature that, hey, this company will keep operating. You don't build it with a plan of shutting it down. Anytime you plan it, you build it with a plan that it will go on and on and on. And many companies have existed for many decades, like Coca-Cola, right? Like McDonald's, okay. Um, and you have no, when you're the issuer, you don't have to pay a dividend. So that's an upside, right? The downside is you give up privacy. When you first go public, you open your books to auditors in the government and investors, and they see how you're running your company. And these people are used to seeing the books of many companies, so they're immediately gonna compare you, right? They're gonna benchmark you, compare you to other companies, and you don't wanna get in there looking poorly. So companies that go and issue stock for the first time, come in there typically because they're on a roll. They're doing special things. They might not be making profits, 
In fact, it's common for them not to be making profits, but they're really growing fast and they have some kind of product that people are very excited about. Maybe it's very leading edge. We all know the Facebook story and there are many other stories, Apple and Microsoft and on and on. Okay. So um, downside though, they give up profits. Okay. Excuse me, privacy. Uh, they give up profits and they give up power, meaning when they give up profits, they pay, they pay dividends and, the, and they will pay dividends in a way they're forced to. Think about this one because other companies are paying dividends. So if two competitors have a similar business and the other guy is paying dividends, you have pressure on you to pay dividends or your stock price will crash. It'll go down. And so you have pressure on you, in other words, to run the company as profitably, as efficiently as you can to protect your shareholders. Now, think about that. Normally, we think of companies being predatory against customers, right? Uh, or maybe employees. But managers have to be... Uh, bridled because they can be very aggressive against the company. Doesn't that sound a little unfair? If somebody puts their money in a company, if you own a company, is it fair for someone to overpay himself when you are the owner? All right. So that's who the shareholders are. All right. So that's the downside for the issuer. Um, uh, they're in a competition for shareholders as well. Meaning when you see it within one market, say McDonald's, Burger King, their price is going together, right? There are things impacting them both, but if one's going up and the other one's going down, that's competition for shareholders because typical portfolios say we want to own so much of hamburger, fast food hamburger stocks. And if McDonald's is going up, then Burger King, believe me, will respond. They'll do whatever they can, anything they can think of, to try to boost up that stock price. So they're competing for shareholders to like their stock. Um, and you get regulated. Oh, the, the amount of regulation companies go through if you haven't, if you don't work in a corporation or you're not in the investment industry, would really stun you. It could free, it would freeze you. It would uh, maybe make you want to leave. Uh, companies make that a part of their cost and they deal with it. It's uncomfortable. It's awkward. It's cumbersome, but they get regulated and they do it. The worst fear that issuers have is being taken over. If your shares are outstanding and somebody buys 51% of your shares, they control the company. They can kick everybody out of the company and they can put in their own team to run the company. So that's the ultimate downside, the worst downside to issuing shares. Here's the first stock exchange in the 1600s in Amsterdam, the Amsterdam, the Netherlands. I found this online. Here, here are the rights you have as a shareholder. Easy stuff. Okay. You own those profits of the company, those earnings. They're yours. Even when they get pushed back into the company, you still own the company and you own those earnings that are being pushed back into the company to make it grow or make it maintain its level. Okay. You have the right to receive dividends. You, have, you can attend the annual shareholders meetings and uh, any other special shareholders meetings. You get to vote because you own stocks. You get to vote one for one. Usually for every share of stock you have, you get one vote and you can sell the shares. So if you have a lot of the shares, uh, that's a powerful right. Excuse me. I'm going to slide out of here because of my mini cold. I'm going to just do that. Excuse me. All right. Okay. Here we go. So, uh, you can vote on key issues. Where was I? Yeah. Including selling the company, you can sell the shares, right? So if you're a powerful shareholder, owner, you can sell the shares. Some people do this. Uh, you could not buy the shares. If you're a big enough, powerful enough person and you got that much kind of that kind of money, you can you can uh, have announced, for example, that you think you're going to go into some shares and then change your mind and you could really hurt this share price. They're represented by the board of directors. So no, don't forget this. The board of directors is there to represent you, legally speaking. But, okay, then this is a big but, pardon the expression. This is a huge but. <laughs> um, but the CEO is usually a large shareholder, okay, and usually chairman of the board. And you want that. You want him to be a large shareholder because you don't want him to not care how much earnings a company has, Okay. You want him to care a lot about that. So you want him to hold a lot of shares and you want him to be chairman of the board because if you believe in him enough to make him CEO, you want him to have enough influence over the company to where he's, his ideas aren't just cut off by the board where they don't encumber him. So he can make quick, efficient decisions, hopefully. And they usually are very competent. Most CEOs, if we gave them some grades, would get good grades. Regulation, real, real quick. The U.S. Securities Exchange Commission regulates the exchanges where stocks are traded and the process of creating stocks and bonds and regulates issuers, okay? So companies that issue, okay, U.S. issuers, I could have put here instead of U.S. companies, register their stocks before they issue them and bonds, okay? You register stocks, register stocks or bonds before you issue them, issue them on a form called the S-1. Um, and then every quarter you file a 10-Q for quarterly and every year you file a 10-K 
And these are really detailed reports, okay? These reports are audited by an external auditor, okay? And the SEC dictates um, how issuers inform prospective buyers of the stock when they're first going to issue, how they inform them, because the, the idea is that when you're selling stock, there was a time before the Great Depression of the 20s and 30s that people could just make up these stories and sell stock very easily and get away with it, and there weren't really good laws to stop it. And so they made explicit laws that say you have really uh, got to follow these strict rules when you represent to a company in a perspective to prospective investors in the prospectus what the company's like. So you put a lot of detail. Okay, let's look at that last paragraph. Form, all these forms contain a lot of detailed administrative, like what's your address and your name and your company, and where do you operate? Management information, like bios of all your managers, major managers. Business information, what are you going to use the funds for? Detailed description of what your business does. Oh, I, I, I'm repeating myself here. I got bios. Oh, financial history, a lot of detail about your financial history and what your position is right now. How much do you have in assets and liabilities? What's your competitive environment? What are your risks? And these are over 100 pages long, typically. So when you go into this world of issuing, you are in for Formsville, Form City. This is the world's oldest known bond. We're on bonds now. Long section. Okay. Thought to have uh, been created around 2,400 years before Christ lived in modern Iraq, then called Mesopotamia. Amazing. So I assume on here it says who owes whom money. And maybe it's a bearer bond. Maybe whoever owns the rock, they could sell it to people, uh, owns the bond. Okay. So here it is. A bond is a transferable security. Transferable meaning you can sell it. Okay. And it is debt. The person who issues a bond, just like they issue stock, they issue bonds, they now owe money. Okay. They are a borrower, borrower, not like a stock. Okay. So when you sell stock, you've got new partners that run the company. When you sell bonds, you're just borrowing money and you got to pay it back. Okay. And the owner of a bond owns it, owns a, owns a loan. Okay. You're a creditor. Okay. Bonds are issued by all levels of government, from your local city uh, to your sewage uh, operation to to uh, your county and your state and the federal government. The U.S. federal government is the largest issuer of bonds in the world. And there are a bunch of federal agencies that issue bonds, like Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae that help people buy houses. They issue bonds and then they buy mortgages with the money they get from issuing bonds. So that helps all the rest of us um, borrow money to buy houses less expensively. Okay. Um, Bonds are issued by businesses. This is huge. This is usually called corporate bonds, and that's why they're called. They're issued by public corporations, and they're called corporate bonds. Most publicly traded bonds are unsecured. This is interesting, okay? Because the issuers, in order to just to get a bond issued, you have to have great credit. No one's going to go in there and issue a bond. No investment bank, because they're the middlemen. You go to an investment bank, they know all the investors. They have a bond desk that trades bonds all day long, and they have an underwriting desk that creates new bonds. So you go to the underwriting desk, and if you're not a great company with great credit, with a great credit rating, you don't even bother calling these guys up. They're not going to talk to you, okay? They're not mean people, but they know no one will buy a bond unless the credit worthiness is very high, okay? Make a long story short, only the companies with the best credit in the world issue bonds and governments. That's who issues bonds, okay? And they're all called fixed income assets. Sometimes we call, call uh, stocks equity, and they call bonds fixed income. Here's some more general uh, information. There is a huge variety of kinds of bonds, okay? Stocks really don't have much variety to them. Bonds are very complex because you can have a different type of issuer like I described earlier, okay? You can have anything from an overnight commercial paper, something they don't call bonds, they call bills or commercial paper, but they're really bonds, okay? Um, technically, they're called commercial paper, but they're the same thing. Company borrows money overnight, pays interest the next day. So you can borrow... Term, the term of a bond could be literally overnight, and I mean companies today borrowed massive amounts of money, especially the companies with the best credit rating, overnight. They just borrowed money overnight for, for a day. Um, and all the way out to 30-year bonds. Very few corporations have ever issued a 30-year bond. It's tough for a corporation to issue beyond 10 years. But the U.S. government has massive amounts of 30-year, 20-year bonds outstanding. Okay, um, Interest rate could be different. In other words... You can have an interest rate that's zero. You can issue a bond. And the way you pay the interest is you issue the bond and you get $50. And you never pay interest. And it matures in five years, but you pay back 100 bucks in five years. Those are zero coupon bonds. Okay? So that's really weird. Different from a bond that, say, pays 12% a year in interest. Okay? 
where you're getting a check in, in uh, every six months. They typically pay every interest every six months. So here you also get bonds that pay interest only once a year, semi-annually, which is every six months, or even every quarter. Um, lots of corporate bonds have either a call or a put or both. Okay, That gets complicated. What did I just say? Here's what it means. For a call, if a bond is callable, the issuer could call it, can buy it under certain circumstances Okay, that favor the issuer. Where the bondholder necessarily doesn't want to be able to doesn't want to have to sell it okay and it's not likely to happen but it could happen and the other way the put option in a bond is the investor has the right to sell it under some conditions to the company when the company really doesn't want to buy it back okay again it's not likely to happen but it's there to protect both sides if the bond price goes too high this gets complicated but i'll say it once if the bond price gets too high it's in the company's interest to just buy it back OK, and if the bond price gets too low, it's definitely in the investor's interest to sell it back to the company. Right. At a certain price. So if there's a price, a bond that you bought for one hundred dollars per hundred dollars a face and now it's trading uh, at ninety five and maybe wants to go below that, you're very comfortable because guess what? It has a put option at ninety five per hundred and you can just sell it back to the company and they must buy that bond. That's protection for you. OK, but that makes it. Complex. So here's what bond prices have that makes them really complex. How do you calculate the price of a bond? That's a whole course. Okay, literally, it's a lot of work to learn how to price bonds. Um, even the most basic bond, you might cross your eyes. If I, I could teach a whole hour, and I don't know if I could teach it well enough in one hour uh, to to a lay audience. Okay, this is kind of a college course kind of a calculation, and that's interesting, I think. Okay, but anyway, bonds price changes. A bond's price changes when the issuer maybe gets stronger or weaker. If they get stronger, the bond prices go up. And if they get weaker, their credit quality falls. Maybe they don't make as much money as they expected. The bond price goes down. So when you own a bond, if you hold it until it matures, you're fine. The likelihood that companies won't pay at the end when it matures is very low. Probability of default is low. 1%, 2%, small. Okay, um, But uh, if you want to sell a bond while you own it, its price can move all over the place. Okay. And that's complex, and we won't talk a lot about that. So when interest rates change, bond prices all change. Bonds that already exist, the prices all change. To make a long story short, when interest rates rise, bonds in existence fall in value. When interest rates fall, bonds in existence rise in value. That's all I'll say for today. All right? Don't try to understand it. Let that just go. But I've said it in case you care or in case you know. Now you know that I know. All right. Option prices that are contained in the bonds change for a lot of reasons. And they're very complex. Just an option by itself. Uh, the persons who created the option pricing model, called the Black Scholes model, won a Nobel Prize. And here are bonds that contain two options sometimes, right? So pricing that option in the bond also can be very complex. So that's why I say calculating bond prices can be complex. Bond trading can be highly specialized. Yet I just said that bonds are going to be important in the optimal portfolio, and we'll get to that. To make a long story short, you don't have to worry about pricing the bonds yourself because the professionals are pricing them in the market every day and they know how to price them. So you're not going to find a bond that's at the wrong price. Okay, That's, I think, impossible. All right. Here's a corporate bond example. This is not an actual bond. Okay, We'll look at a real bond in a second. But I'll pretend that on January 15 of 2020, just recently, Ford issued a billion dollars of bonds. And let's say it matures on January 15, 2025. It pays 5% of interest a year. Okay, this would be called a Ford 5% of Jan 25, right? Oh, my header, the, the, something looks wrong there. These are called Ford 5% of Jan 25. Anyway, that's sloppy there. Oh, here it comes. Not so bad. Okay, so every six months, Ford pays half of that 5%. So $25 million of interest. And I can assure you, they pay way more than this. And they have many billions of dollars of bonds outstanding right now because Ford is just so massive. I did not look up that number, but trust me, it's many billions. All right. So every six months, they pay 2.5% of 25 million of interest. And the bond can contain a call at 105 and a put at 95. And I talked about those enough. No more about calls and puts. Let's look at the treasury. These are very important bonds because they're considered very low risk or maybe sometimes academically and sometimes they're called zero risk bonds, but they're not really. Every bond has some risk, but they're so safe you can think of them as zero risk. Okay. These are the bonds that the U.S. Treasury issues. Okay. This schedule, I'm going to look at it again. Is the current schedule for, and this schedule actually is only a fourth of the length of the schedule, it goes on to July. This says the days of the week when the U.S. Treasury is going to issue bonds and what they call bills. They call the short-term stuff bills. They call the 
anything under 30 years a note, like 10 and 20 year notes, and then they call 30 years the bond, but they're all bonds, generically speaking. So here it is, look how active they are. So, excuse me, excuse me. <laughs> oh, it's cold, okay, we'll get through this. Pardon me, sorry, sorry. Okay, so here we go. Uh, the, the Treasury is the most active bond issuer, okay? And they show bills, notes, and bonds several days a week, every week. The auction schedule is kept months in advance. And all other, other bonds in the world, this is really important, are priced based on the U.S. Treasury bonds, either directly or indirectly. So when U.S. when the U.S. government and the U.S. as a company, country has good and bad prospects, U.S. Treasury bond prices rise and fall. And there's a simple idea that virtually no one else in the world can have a lower interest rate than the U.S. government because they're the safest. They're the safest credit in the world. So bond prices end up di dictating the interest rate on a bond. Don't try to understand too much. Just trust me on this. And you, and when uh, the interest rates go up for the U.S. government, that means their bond prices went down, the interest rates will go up for all other bonds. It's not like some bond has an interest rate above the U.S. government and suddenly U.S. government will have a higher interest rate and the other bond will stay the same. Sorry, no. There is a spread between the any company's interest rate they're paying, which is above the U.S. Treasury, and when the U.S. Treasury bond rate goes up, so does there. Their spreads move a little, but what moves a lot together is the bonds. The spreads do move around a little bit, depending on how companies are doing, how the country's going. But those are pretty stable, relatively stable. They're very important, those spreads, too, for bond traders. You can do spread trading all day long, and many bond traders do that. All right. So now let's look at a U.S. Treasury bond. It's a real one. On Feb 13, here we are, Feb 24, 11 days ago, the Treasury auctioned $19 billion of bonds, 2.06% coupon. It's called coupon, the rate. Now, that means they're going to pay 2.06% of interest every year, and they will pay half of that every six months. That was a record low yield for Treasury 30 years. The U.S. Treasury right now is borrowing money the world has, and now you, it explains to you. It explains Part of it, and they get away with borrowing. So these bonds settled on Tuesday, January 18, 2020, and they'll mature on January 18, 2050, the 30-year bonds. That was big news because they don't issue, sometimes they can get away from 30-year bonds for a while, then they went back to them and they were very successful. Okay, and I, I just said it, they'll pay 2.06% interest per year, 2.06% interest per year, half of that every six months. And it's called the Treasury 2.06s of 2050, okay? So that's how we think about it. Now, here's something really important, bond ratings, okay? So this table on the left, let's just look at the Moody's column, okay? They have these bond ratings for short-term debt and long-term debt. Don't look at the others, the yellow and blue. Just look at the pink guy. So for long-term debt, which is most of these bonds that are over a year, okay? They have these ratings from AAA all the way down to C. If it were a D, they would be in default, okay? And so... If you are a super great uh, credit like the U.S. government, you get AAA. Government, U.S. government no longer has AAA. U.S. government now has AA, okay? Um, but they used to have AAA. Now they're down to AA. Still very few entities have AA credit, very, very few. Um, so you, if you have AA, you're a wonderful credit. You pay very low interest rates. And as your credit quality goes lower, like most corporates are in the BAA one right here. Okay, BAA. And we, let's look at the S&P column in the middle. It's more simple. We call those triple Bs. We don't call them BAAs. That's confusing. So let's stay in the yellow column for a second and start over. Triple As are on top. Double As come next. Single As come next. Triple Bs, double Bs, single Bs. You're going down to Cs and Ds. Okay. All right. So here's something to know. If you're above, if you're triple B minus and above, you are what's called investment grade. And you're considered safe. And many, 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 many companies and governments are allowed to buy your bonds if you're an issuer. But if you are below that line, and if you are double B or lower, then many entities are not allowed to buy your bonds that are considered not investment grade. They're called high yield and junk. Here we go. Let's see what I say about this. So rating agencies like Moody's, S&P, and Fitch uh, give ratings from AAA down to D. Okay, They charge corporates for the ratings, right? But they rate government bonds for free. Okay? They just do that. And uh, the three rating agencies are Moody, Standard & Poor's, and Fitch's. And they really impact bond interest rates, okay? And they impact who can buy them, okay? Most corporations and financial institutions don't hold below triple B. Again, I just said it, not, not investment grade, high yield or junk. 
The stay with bonds, that's an old bond coupon. We don't have bond coupons anymore. You can actually have one printed and they'll charge you 300 bucks to print a bond coupon for you. Uh, but no one does it anymore. That's all electronic. Bonds are denominated in large amounts, typically $1,000, $5,000. And they're bought, bought by large institutions, uh, mutual funds, ETFs. Individuals don't buy them directly almost ever, never. What we do is we buy them through mutual funds, e ETFs, and hedge funds. Okay. Um, and a bond has something called an indenture. This is an, this is administrative stuff, not hard to learn. An indenture is just a document. Okay, And every bond that's issued has a document, and it says... What the features are, when it was issued, when it matures, what the interest rate is. Okay, so it's not completely done until the instant they create the bond. So that indenture is almost completely done, and the moment they create the bond, the company goes to work filling out the rest of the indenture. It's all done on a computer nowadays. They push a button, and it gets sent to the government, and it gets sent to the market, so everyone knows the bond exists and all of its features. Okay, bonds continue covenants, which are like you know, if you get covenanted, if you have a covenant on you, you're obligated to do something. That's what that's what they do. They restrict invest. Uh, issuers um let's see uh my I, my bullet points aren't in order let's look at point number three the most important covenants limit how much debt a company can take on once you issue debt it limits how much more debt you can take on okay they live plenty they leave plenty of wiggle room for companies to run themselves the way they need to run themselves they're not overly restrictive but they are restrictive they don't let a company go nuts and just start borrowing all the money they want okay um and if there is a uh there is a trustee who enforces all this stuff. And the trustee, in fact, gets that bond indenture. They hold it. They're the guy who enforces it. Make sure all payments get made when they need to be made, et cetera. Trustee is an important role in a bond. You don't have stock trustees. That doesn't exist. Okay. If there is a late payment or if the issuer violates any covenant, the bond is in default. And typically, they're obligated to pay it right back. They might not be able to pay it right back when they go in default, but they have the legal obligation. Excuse me. Okay. I'm going to get some water. I'm out of water. No, not quite. Should have refilled. Okay. Okay. The prime, here we're going. We're, new topic mutual funds. These are important. Primary important purpose of mutual funds. Okay. Forget about bonds, though. Big topic. We're in investment types. Mutual funds, they offer a single investment that acts like a diversified portfolio, which makes it a lot safer. Mutual funds issue shares. Okay. Right. Before they buy anything, they need to have the money. And then they use the proceeds of those share issues their share issuance to buy a variety of investments. They typically have a combination of stocks and bonds and corporate bonds and some mutual funds literally pursue the uh, optimal portfolio approach. That's their approach. Okay? There are, I think they're called risk adjusted uh, mutual funds. I'll get back to that in a, in a future episode. Okay. There are 4,000 stocks listed in the U.S., but there are 10,000 mutual funds listed. And how could that be? Well, because any fund can have any combination of stocks, right? Let's say you have five students, and then um, that would be the stocks. Let's say we only have five stocks. But then other people could come in and invest in these five stocks. Well, you can have many combinations within the five stocks. You could buy only stock A. Somebody else could buy only stock C. Somebody could buy some combination of the other, of the stocks. Excuse me again. Sorry, sorry. Okay. I feel great, though. Nose is a little running, but I feel great. Okay. So... No, that's why there are lots of mutual funds, and they hold 40% of the market. That's huge, worth $12 trillion. Uh, they pay fees. They charge fees. That's how they make money. All these figures are very rounded. Mutual fund example. Mutual fund manager, MFD. Mutual fund, MFD. They think, oh, let's, let's get a fund going that invests in transportation companies. We think we can sell those because no one else is doing that. So we create a fund called TRANS. And they distribute a prospectus, and it says the objectives of the fund, what the strategies will be, what the fees will be, what type of fund. There are different types of fund funds we won't go into. So they issue 100 million shares at 10 bucks. They raise a billion dollars, and then they buy 990 million dollars of stocks and bonds, maybe issued by transportation companies. Okay, they keep some cash on hand so they can pay their employees and run the fund. And they have to rebalance this thing, so they have to have cash on hand to be rebalancing it. Sometimes they do run low on cash, and they sell shares to buy other shares to rebalance and it's not necessarily a problem it's just the way that cycle works okay so here we go at the end of each day they set their share price based on the assets so they look at the value of all the assets in the fund and that's uh, they add them up divide it by the number of shares outstanding so let's say all the assets in the fund are worth 10 billion dollars let's say you had 10 million dollars outstanding that's a thousand 
they would be worth a thousand each. Uh, each of the shares that the fund would would have issued would would be worth a thousand each. A million divided by a billion divided by a million is a thousand. I think. I hope. No, that's right. Trust me. Okay. All right. So anyway, so they set the share price every day, and then shareholders don't buy and sell fund shares in the market. They buy them straight directly from the fund. Okay. And when the fund's assets change value, it buys and sells assets so that it gets its target balance back in line. Okay. So some assets will go up in value and they'll be over overrepresented in the portfolio. And hey, it's time to sell them. You have a gain, not a bad idea. You have a gain, sell it and capture your gain. Some shares uh, lose value and you may want to buy them because you can buy them cheaply or you can buy similar share, shares cheaply. They've gone down in value. So you're selling the ones that have gone up in value and you're buying cheaper stuff. In theory, if you buy low and sell high, you're doing well. And it tends to work. That's why they exist. If not, they would not exist. Someday we'll talk about different kinds of funds. Okay, here we go. Now we're going to talk about exchange-traded funds. This is the modern mutual fund. ETFs are very similar to mutual funds. Now, remember, mutual fund investors buy and sell mutual fund shares from and to the fund. And they and that price is set once a day. Not an ETF. An ETF is put out on the market and you buy it in the market all day long. So what's going on is, whereas a mutual fund at the end of the day does the math to calculate the value of the assets and divides by the number of shares outstanding, the ETF computers are churning, doing this continuously all day. And this enables us to just buy them and sell them on the market. And the ETF is in there, uh, the ETF fund managers in there also buying and selling, adjusting the portfolio, keeping it within the ranges that it's supposed to work. That's a complicated thing, but it has made ETFs more liquid and more popular. They're gaining a lot of ground. Um, so ETFs rebalance, like I say, continuously. They reprice continuously. Why? Because now we have better trading systems, speed and integration and stability. And legally, they got all the, I'll say, all the pieces in place where they could pull it off. And that was an achievement. So they've been around a long time. If you look at the chart, ignore the chart in a way. This chart is old because it starts in 2001 and ends in 2014, five years ago. But we get to see that in 01, we had them. That's when they started, apparently. So it's nice to know they've been around for 19, well, 20 years. Right, more or less. Okay. So now we're going to look at hedge funds. Okay, a hedge fund is a very, very unique, specialized investment manager, and in fact, a hedge fund is the most colorful and most profitable investor there is. All right. Here's why. I have just run out of water, so I'll be running to the restroom here next to me for water in a moment. Okay, hedge funds are highly specialized who's, uh, managers, but they serve only wealthy, what's called an accredited investor. What's an accredited investor? And darn, doesn't that make sense that they wouldn't be available for all of us, that they're only available for those of us who are very wealthy? Okay. Accredited investors earn 200K a year individually for several years, or if you're married, uh, 300K per year for several years. Or you may have, if you have a hundred million, excuse me, if you have a million dollars of net worth, not including your primary residence, then you're accredited. So top hedge funds, top hedge funds, not all hedge funds. That's a completely different thing. There are thousands of hedge funds now, right? Anybody who sits around and invests for himself gets to call himself a hedge fund. But the top hedge funds have made massive profits consistently. Some have done it illegally through insider trading. Not going to get into that a lot today. Not most of them. Most of them have made it through through uh, high-speed trading. And all, not always the cleanest way, but that's not for today's episode. I will do a whole hedge fund episode at some point. But they've made a lot, a lot of money, okay? They pay the highest salaries of any occupation in 2013. And this, I haven't updated this. I did this, I created a, a presentation in 014. So I had 013 data. I did not update this. But in 013, George Soros, a hedge fund manager, he made $4 million, okay? The most of anybody that year. That's $2 million an hour if you work 40 hours a week. Can you imagine making $2 million bucks an hour? Um, and in that same year, the top 25 hedge fund managers, including Mr. Soros, earned 18 times the top 25 CEOs. So people are complaining that CEOs make 200 times uh, their average employee in a company. And here you have hedge fund managers making 18 times what the top CEOs are making. So there's a book about it called More Money Than God by a guy named, uh, I think, Sebastian Malaby. Just remember that. Don't trust the name. Maybe Malaby is the last name. I wish I had a better memory. But anyway, more money than God. It tells the history of hedge funds. It's a little dated, but you can't, I couldn't forget that title, more, more money than God. Okay. Here are the competitive advantages of a hedge fund. They have four fundamental competitive advantages. Okay. 
They hire the smartest mathematicians and programmers in the world. They hire them from all over the world from the best schools. Okay. And in fact, it's kind of a brain drain for the rest of the world. I wish more of these mathematicians and programmers would try to cure cancer and heal the uh, environment, but, but I can't blame them for going to a hedge fund because they get paid so much money. They have tremendous computer power. Okay. They get to use something called shorting. I'll talk more about it. And they get to use derivatives. I'll talk more about those in uh, coming slides. Okay. So shorting and derivatives can be extremely dangerous because they can change value way faster than say a stock or a bond a hundred times more. Okay. So derivatives are like playing with fire, but we all cook with fire because we know it's worth it because we know how to be careful. So if you're skillful, okay, you're okay using derivatives and shorting. Here we go. Because shorting and derivatives are very volatile, regulators don't let normal investment managers use them, okay? They don't let normal ETFs use them, okay? And so that means individuals don't get access. Well, we don't go out and short the market and use derivatives. Most of us don't. I can do that. I have done that because I am an experienced uh, professional trader. So I've done that on my own account. However, I would not recommend to anybody unless they were a professional trader that they go out and start trading derivatives. So a lot of people go out and they start buying and trading uh, options, particularly and I see these videos at night and I just roll my eyes because uh, if you go on YouTube and look at videos, you'll see lots of people who say, I saw this commercial at night. I started buying options. I lost money. Okay. Um, it takes some real skill and knowledge to make money consistently with a, taking a reasonable amount of risk. And part of that is to watch the market or to set up uh, pre, uh, pre-prepare pre orders that protect you no matter which way the market goes. It takes a lot of skill and experience to do that effectively. Okay. So, okay. So that makes it, the regulations make it difficult for us to access shorting and derivatives, but hedge funds are unrestricted because they're, I should have put this all in bold. Their credit, they, their investors are accredited. When you have only accredited investors, the government says you do what you wish. These people have a lot of money. They are sophisticated, or at least they can bear to lose money. So we're going to let you go ahead and do whatever you want with their money. Now, here's some unique aspects to hedge funds. They typically, oh well, we're going to be behind today. I'm going to tell you right now, we are not going to finish in an hour. Uh, we're going to probably go an hour and a half. You can hang with me, or you could just uh, hang up and then watch this later, or not. But there's a lot of great stuff here. And I knew it would go long, and I, I meant to warn you in the beginning. But here we go. So I'm guessing another 40 minutes, maybe less, maybe less, maybe half an hour. But here we go. Uh, hedge funds okay, require a billion-dollar investment. Well, if you're a large, you know, if you're an accredited investor, you've got the money. Give them your money. They charge 2% management fee, which is common among investment managers, but they also take something unique, 20% of gains, typical, okay? Some have charged more, okay, because their gains have been so consistent so many years People still buy into the hedge fund. They handle their money because they still make a lot of money, even though they pay that huge percentage of their gains. Okay, They require a minimum, minimum, typical minimum investment period of a year. So when you handle your money, you can't just get out because a hedge fund could be swinging around like crazy in value. Some people could get cold feet and want to get out. Hedge funds say, sorry, you're going to hang with us because we do stuff that moves around a lot. That's what we do. Some of them. Some hedge funds are at the opposite end. Some of the best hedge funds don't have value swinging around a lot. Some do. So hedge fund managers, here's something that's the best thing about hedge funds right here. They own the same stuff you own. Okay. At least if they're not cheating. That means that if you do well, they do well. And that means they're going to work really hard for you to do well. Okay. This is why they get away with charging 20% of gains. And when you have losses, by the way, I'm not sure if, um, give you back some of your losses I, I just thought of that so if they're taking away some of your gains maybe when you have losses they help you get that back i suspect no i think when you have losses you just eat the losses okay so by the way not all hedge funds hedge hedging is very complex way beyond the scope of these shows that's like pricing bonds maybe even more complex because you use derivatives to hedge typically but i'll go back Hedging is a misnomer because some hedge funds don't hedge at all. Many hedge funds don't hedge at all. Some hedge a lot. Okay. So now hedge funds are famous for their strategies. Global macro. Doesn't that sound big? Global macro. It is. George Soros, when he made the $4 billion, he made it mostly on one massive trade with the British pound. And if I remember correctly, the British pound lost value and he made a lot of money and the British government was mad that this guy should make money on the pound losing value. Hang on for a second. I'll get some water. I am out. Oh. 
Just a sec here. Sorry. So sorry. All right, I'm back. Excuse me. Eh, you needed a break, and I needed a break. Maybe I should take it out. I'll break at the hour, Mark. Maybe I will. Didn't think of that. That's a good idea. <laughs> I will. I'll take a break at the hour, Mark. Okay. So then, here we are. I'm back. So, um, am I lower now? <laughs> Let's see here. Let's see here. I think so. See if I'm in the right, the right place. I have a cushion. Um, I'll check the monitor because uh, if my head's sticking off the top, maybe I'll just move the camera. Or no, I'm fine. I think I'm okay. Move it up a tiny, tiny bit. Let's see here. Oh, okay. I'm a little higher now. Okay, so I've got about ten or fifteen seconds. All right, I'm all right. Okay, so here we go. Global macro funds, they can bet on big stuff, big global stuff, currency rates, interest rates, oil prices, gas prices, metals, stocks, indexes, really anything. But here's what they're really doing. Here's why they can make the massive money, global macro, because the markets they're in are massive. If you're buying Ford stock, in a way, it's a lot because Ford has a lot of stock outstanding, many billions of dollars, right? But compared with the trillions of dollars of currency that gets traded every day, Ford stock is nothing. It's a drop. And so if you're a big person that tries to take big positions in Ford stock, it's not necessarily easy. When you go to buy the Ford stock, the stock might get driven way up in price on you. Currencies might not move at all. And other national, uh, international um, assets like gold, you know, there's just so much gold out there uh, that you can do massive trades and prices won't work against you. You might have better anonymity too. You want to be anonymous when you're doing big trading because you don't want other people copycatting you or front running you. If, if you want to sell, you don't want everyone knowing that you need to sell because they're going to just offer you less, right? When they offer to buy your stuff. If you want to buy, you don't want people knowing you want to buy big positions because they're going to just charge you more and they know you're in the market trying to buy. Okay. So global macro takes bets on big picture stuff, events and news. Trading really is could be related to global macro because if the news for a country or an event occurs for a country, it can impact the country's currency. But event and news trading could just be about a company taking over another company. Okay, so mergers, bankruptcies, litigation—these things that kind of shock the price of a stock, and all of a sudden it's good news or bad news. Um, they what they do is program computers so that the moment the computer literally reads headlines now, and the moment that the event is announced, the computer knows to either buy or sell, and they do many many trades in small amounts. Okay, because they don't want to, um, again, get prices going against them, and they'll just keep doing it for all the events, say, of the day, all across the market. Imagine a computer, a group of computers with a lot of power just watching all the events that day and doing a bunch of event, little event trades and trying to be secretive about it. That's, this is what their hedge funds are doing, okay? They're doing it on behalf of their investors. Um, relative value or arbitrage uh, styles take advantage of what are called price misalignments. And a simple example is if a company's stock goes up, its bonds should be moving similarly to the stock because if it's doing well and the stock is going up, then its credit worthiness should be going, uh, should be improving as well. And when they see things go out of line, let's say they see bonds don't go up enough when stock goes up, then they realize the bonds are cheap, the stocks are high, all right? You sell high, you sell the bond, you sell the stock because it's high and you buy the bond because it's cheap. I hope I didn't say that backwards. I do have some serious dyslexia. But I think I said it right. So you buy low, sell high. Whatever looks cheap, you buy. Whatever looks high, you sell. And then they realign. So you're buying and selling the same amount. So you end up net cash, no cash. Okay, You sold something, you got cash, and you bought something. You used the cash to buy something. And then when the price is adjust, and usually they do, if you're good at this, then you just, without putting any of your own cash in, uh, made an arbitrage. Okay, And they're good at it. They arbitrage lots of different things that are what's called correlated. To each other. Oh, that bond example was a great example, but there are many other things that get arbitraged, like just the price of a currency in one market and another market. If they find that the euro is trading more cheaply in uh, Europe than in the U.S., then they'll buy it in Europe and sell it in the U.S. Just like that. Okay, and that doesn't last long. That lasts a fraction of a second, and then the prices line up again. But they're out there arbitraging everything. 
directional is interesting because what they found um, um, is, and it's break time. Okay, I'll, I'll, when the slide ends, we'll take a break. But directional is interesting because what they have found, and, and really it's not an hour yet because I started I started two after to give you time to get your coffee or whatever to look at my slides that contain my pre-show information. Anyway, directional. Prices have had tendencies to sometimes remain the same when really, in theory, like under optimal portfolio theory, maybe they should not continue going up. But psychologically, we keep buying stuff because we love it. Let's say Facebook. Maybe we love Facebook too much and it's going up too much just because we see it every day. We use it every day and we see it going up. So by sh no other reason, simply by the fact that it goes up a lot, we're, we're buying it. That's psychological and that's trend trading. And then there's the other thing at certain points. They call them uh, inflection points. There, there are hundreds of terms. They use Fibonacci lines that tell you when you've reached a point uh, of resistance, and et cetera. I've never paid a lot of attention to that. We did not use that when, when we when we worked. When I worked, we used fundamentals. We watched, we watched the fundamentals of how companies were doing and how the economy was doing. We didn't look at charts, except if we saw extreme, extreme things like right now, the, the whole market is too high. Then you're looking at a chart. The chart of the market is telling you the whole market's too high. But on a daily basis, we, we didn't sit around drawing lines on charts and thinking that we had we were better at drawing lines than somebody else. Okay, but you can teach, train a computer to do that. It checks the way prices are moving and it checks when they ramp up really fast, whether they come down faster or if they ramp up like a hoop, and will they come down faster? Or if they ramp up gradually, start to fade, will they come down? And you can start maybe predicting price a little more than the average person. And that's all you need. If you're doing many, many trades, small trades, but all you have to do is win by a little bit, a tiny percentage, a fraction of a percentage. But if you're doing millions of trades a day, you can make millions of dollars a day. Okay. And this is what hedge funds are doing. Multi-strategy combines any of these and many others. This is nowhere near the whole list, but these are some of the best known strategies. The bottom one is probably the best known because it's all kind of the same stuff. Program, algorithmic, black box, high frequency, low latency, Artificial intelligence, all this means you're just getting computer programmers and mathematicians to go in there and go nuts <laughs> and find any kind of mathematical relationship. And you train the computer to look for them. And if they find some kind of mathematical relationship between the prices of something, and something else that helps them to predict anything, they try to exploit it by doing lots of very fast trades on a computer. Okay, that's it. It's break time, and I'll back up and say that um, that I'll have a sip of water, and I'll take a minute. It's oh, it's yeah. Um, I know I'm rushing a little. It's my personality, partly. It's my excitement to teach you uh, and challenge you a little bit. And remember, you can pause this stuff, and you can rewind uh, if you want to come back to it. Okay. If we didn't have pause and rewind, I would slow way down. Uh, but you can skip forward and just go to spots that you were curious about. And then you can start doing your own thinking and your own research. And I definitely encourage you to do that. I really mean it when I say, don't trust me uh, any more than any other stranger if you don't know me. Right? Please listen. And if it feels like I know kind of, you know, like I've done my homework, that's great. That's my hope. I have. I will tell you. I worked very hard preparing all of this. Uh, but um, it just makes common sense. Right, that if you don't know me, that you don't just take what I'm saying as that's it, that's the law. Al knows it all. No one knows it all. There are people who could teach this better than I could teach it. But I do love it, and I do have a lot of experience teaching it. So in every job I had in investment banking and in treasury, I taught all of this and plenty, plenty more. For example, there's something called a Bloomberg Workstation, and uh, way back when they got started uh, being used, I immediately became aware of their immense value, how powerful they were as an, inter and just an interface. And uh, everywhere I worked, I promoted the heavy use of Bloomberg workstations and I became uh, probably what Bloomberg would call a, a super user. Um, but that doesn't mean I know most of Bloomberg. Bloomberg is so massive, it's an ocean. I kid you not, I know an island in an ocean of what Bloomberg can do. And that still makes me a super user because it is so vast what it does. It's incredible how skillfully they have created uh, Bloomberg's company. And we're talking about Bloomberg the company that was founded by Mr. Bloomberg, who's running to be the Democratic nominee. All right, let's get to work here. Now, we're going to go back to exchange-traded funds because we just talked about them earlier, and then we talked about hedge funds. But we talked about how you can't access shorting 
and derivatives through conventional investment managers and exchange traded funds, but that has changed. We now have something called alternative ETFs. I just learned about this this week. I had kind of heard of it, but I didn't know that much about ETFs. So I, I didn't realize what a breakthrough this is for everyone until th this last week. So an alternative ETF is relatively new and it lets the uh, ETF fund, ETF manager, use hedge fund strategies, but yet they're selling their shares to you and me, not accredited investors. Everyone could buy these shares. They can short, they can use derivatives, and they can do any of those hedge fund techniques and strategies that we looked at, right? So these are exciting because uh, they don't even charge that massive fee, okay? Remember that 2%, 20% fee? ETFs aren't charging that. They're making small fees, 1% or less of the size of the fund. So I'm going to maybe do even a whole show on those or certainly devote lots more time to alt, uh, ETFs. So now, if you have a portfolio, start talking to whoever you uh, manages your money, if they do, or if you're managing your own money, do your homework, please. Learn about alternative ETFs. Because the irony, right? The irony of hedge funds, and let's see if I created this um, slide. No, I guess I didn't create this bullet point. The irony of hedge funds is this. They use riskier stuff. They use fire. They use shorting and they use derivatives. But they can be safer because they use that, because they use it skillfully. All right. And I guess it's kind of like saying someone could be a safer cook with fire than someone who never uses fire. Why? Well, because when we use fire, a nice analogy, a nice metaphor. When we use fire, we're killing bacteria, right? So someone who doesn't know how to use fire, yeah, they're safer, but they're not killing bacteria. Right? Um, well, that's a wonderful metaphor. So yes, the better cooks use fire, right? And no one says don't use fire. So in the same sense, really, no one should say to a hedge fund or any knowledgeable investor, don't use derivatives, don't short. Not, not correct. Now we're going to go straight into derivatives, okay? A derivative is a contract. Remember that. Now notice something. It's not a stock. It's not a bond, right? It's not an index. It's a contract literally signed by two parties, okay? And the value of the contract derives from the value of something, whatever you pick, the underlying. The underlying usually is stocks or bonds, but it could be a house. You could buy an option to buy a book, right? Hollywood pays an author $25,000 for an option for a year, and they say, we will, if we decide to make them a movie based on your book, we'll pay a million bucks for the book. And we're going to pay you an option. We're going to pay $25,000. And you can't sell your story to anybody else. Okay. So the underlying is the story in that example. Someone else can uh, buy an option from someone that gives them the right to buy a house at a certain price. And then if the house price goes down, uh, they won't buy it. But if the house price goes way up, if they have the right to buy a house at a million bucks, but the house goes way up to two million, they're going to buy the house at a million bucks under that contract. So that's what an option is. So the the, the options value derives from the value of the uh, underlying. Okay. Derivative. That's why it's called derivative, because the value derives from the underlying. All right. So a stock option price, again, derives from an underlying stock price. But an underlying, can I set it? Stock, bond, even an interest rate can be an underlying. An index commodity like gold or pork bellies or whatever can be the underlying. Currency uh, prices, something called swaps. You don't want to know what swaps are yet. Uh, even another derivative can be an underlying. Okay, that could be a really dangerous derivative, one that's a derivative whose underlying is a derivative. But they, they do exist. All right, what you just do is do them very carefully. You do them in small amounts, and they're super powerful. Change value a thousand times more than the underlying. Okay. Basic derivatives are forwards, options, which are calls and puts and swaps. We won't talk any more about swaps. They're very important in corporations. Interest rate swaps. There are other kinds of swaps, but the swaps, but the most common kind of swap is something called an interest rate swap. Okay, three features make derivatives very, very powerful. I said it before, the change in value of a derivative can be very much more than the change in value of the underlying, 100 times more. Change in value could be customized. For example, a derivative can be one where it goes up in value if the underlying goes down in value. And that is a put. If you buy a put, I will get into it in too detail. If you buy a put to be able to sell somebody a house for a million bucks, let's say the house value falls to half a million dollars. If I'm not confused, then you have the right to sell that. And you would. You'd sell for a million dollars, right? And you'd... You'd, uh, you would have uh, 
sold a half million dollar for a million, a half million dollar house for a million dollars. You will have done well. Okay. Uh, and then the third feature is that they settle in cash. Okay. So you have the most derivatives that give you the right to buy, say, stock or in my examples, the right to buy a story or the right to buy uh the right to buy a house. Okay. In real life, a story or a house might actually be by me delivered at the end, but or, or settled at the end, right? But not financial uh uh derivatives. Financial derivatives are just uh neutralized by taking on a reverse position okay so you've bought calls and puts and what you do is you sell them you, you can actually exercise calls and puts but that's clumsy you're better off just selling one at the end because if it's in the money if it's going to make money it'll be worth a lot of money and in the end everybody just exchanges cash in the house example in other words the person who bought the house for a million worth half million they don't actually have to buy the house for a million they just get a half million profit this is the way the contracts were designed okay don't worry if you're confused. It's okay. But derivatives settling cash makes them incredibly convenient. Now you can do tons of derivatives and not worry about um, owning a bunch of shares of stock you don't even want to own <laughs> or bonds or indexes, etc. Here we go. There's two. There's a photo of two people here, Myron Scholes and Fisher Black. They discovered the Black-Scholes formula that prices options. Robert Merton also figured out the formula in 1973. And Merton and Scholes got a Nobel Prize. Black would have gotten one, but he died. In 90, by 97, he was dead when they gave the Nobel Prize for discovering this formula that prices options. It is that important. It's a pillar of modern finance. And in fact, you can use options to price anything, a stock, a house, a pencil. If you really learn how to use a stock uh, formula correctly and you apply it correctly. So it, it, they didn't expect that when they first created it. And it turned out to be way more meaningful, powerful than it initially was thought to be. So this is part of why they got the Nobel, Nobel Prize. Okay, derivatives are very derided, no question, because of volatility and complexity and because their misuse has led to company huge problems for companies and even the economy in 07 and 08. Part of the big problem was that there are these bonds called asset-backed bonds that are effectively a derivative. An asset-backed bond is a complex derivative um, whose value is based on how people will pay off mortgages, whether, whether or not they'll pay them off early or late. And that hurt the economy tremendously. So pe lots of people still believe they're dangerous. You'll have people, even educated people, all right? Even educators, professors, who will still say that, uh, I've seen it with my own eyes, I was surprised, uh, that will say that shorting and derivatives are dangerous. Um, uh, and uh, But again, by now you know I don't agree. You just have to know what you're doing, okay? People don't generally, last bullet point here, we don't directly, most of us don't directly or, or directly invest in derivatives. Uh, they're complex, they're volatile, they mature. All right, we'd rather have just a stock that never uh, matures, right? So uh, other than through hedge funds, that's how we end up owning them. <clears throat> or through alternative ETFs now. All right, but here are examples of derivatives. A forward, we're gonna fly through these quarter after. Forward obligates the buyer and the seller to exchange the underlying underlying so it's not an option now at the beginning you agree that in a year you will buy the house from someone and you'll buy it at the market price on that day you have an agreement that's so on that day you buy it at the market price they sell it to you at the market price that's a forward okay and a futures contract is the same as a forward except it's traded on a futures exchange we won't get into that too much uh, but you could do a forward directly with someone over the counter uh in, in corporations and they do a lot of those especially especially with investment bank and banks but you can just go to a futures exchange and buy and sell futures contracts to your heart's content. It's a massive market, and it's the largest futures um, exchange is this the Chicago Mercantile Exchange exchange combined with the Chicago Board Options Trade Exchange. I might have said those wrong, but they've now merged and they're in Chicago, and uh, the, the 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 volume of futures is incredible. Whenever you see pits, including in a movie that. Uh, Freddie, uh, Eddie Murphy was in. When you see pits and you see people trading and screaming, typically those are futures pits. And that's what that was in that movie, Futures Pits, at the Chicago markets. Okay. So an option is a call or a put. A call is the right but not the obligation to buy. So you buy a call and you have the right to buy something at a certain price. But you don't have to. Okay. So that way if you have the right to buy something for $100, but you could just buy it that same day for $50, bucks, you do not buy it for $100. You just buy it for $50. Bucks. Okay. And a put. Okay. And this put is similar. You have the right to sell something. 
let's say you have a guitar you want to sell and you can you have the right to sell it for a thousand dollars to somebody but the market price is two thousand dollars well, you don't have to sell it you have a put you could sell it for a thousand but out in the market you can sell it for two thousand so they're very valuable these derivatives are the building blocks of all derivatives forwards which are futures and then options calls and puts all the other words the others derived from this okay currencies this is easy there are 180 currencies in the world there are 195 countries and more currency trades than anything else in the world five trillion daily but a currency is not a company that's making profit creating value and a currency is not a bond that's selling that's paying five six seven percent so a currency doesn't isn't something you just buy and hold usually and you expect i'm just going to buy and hold this currency and i'm going to make a lot of money you're just holding cash then what you could what you would do is you're buying and holding currency you buy a cd a certificate of deposit and you'd make a little bit of interest but most currency trading is just done by companies who import and export if companies are exporting stuff they're selling it overseas they get paid in foreign currency and they sell that currency they receive a foreign currency they sell it they buy dollars they have just traded they've sold the foreign currency i did a lot of that many billions in fact hundreds of billions of dollars for an investment banker that is not a boast that's normal i'm not i'm not somebody who did an unusual amount of volume more than uh, the average investment banker um so you end up that's one of the reasons investment bankers do make uh, are well paid because the transaction size is so massive all you have to charge is a tiny percent of a fee and you are well paid okay um but anyway so currency trading is profitable for banks and import export companies uh buy and sell currencies if you're an exporter again you sell foreign currencies if you're uh, an importer you buy foreign currencies so you can buy stuff you're importing so if you're buying stuff from china you buy the chinese currency so you can buy uh chinese products okay all right and most of us don't do it the investment banks dominate foreign currency trading individuals don't do much of that here we go holding currencies pays very little and they don't get i said it earlier they don't grant ownership of a business like stock and they do react to factors that people don't pay attention to a lot especially a lot of economic factors how many of you know what is the inflation rate in england right now you know i should know that and i don't remember what it is oh there was a time when i could i knew the inflation rates probably of every you know the top 100 countries in the world anyway so this is the kind of stuff that you track. You track unemployment, inflation. You track imports and exports. You you track trade deficits. This is the stuff that affects currency prices. And professional currency traders who take risk watch that stuff very closely. They trade off of that stuff. And that could be hedge funds. They do this stuff. Currency prices can be confusing. And believe me, they can be. Even an experienced currency trader might get confused. Am I, uh, if I have a price, is it yen per dollar or dollar per yen? Okay, that could be, you can get upside down. So the conventions are that uh, if you buy and sell yen and dollars against each other, you buy in yen per dollar. But if you buy and sell euros, you buy in dollars per euro. So the price you look at is dollars per euro. Okay. But if you're looking at a yen price, it's yen per dollar. So if you don't have experience, you can easily, especially if you're acting quickly, you can get upside down and do, do a trade you don't want to do. Uh, if you try to do trades that are small, the, the, the banks are going to make a lot of money on you. So only companies that do really big trades, half a billion, way more than that, uh, um, find it practical to do it. Okay, uh, But careful. If anybody actually thinks they want to invest in currencies, they can lose a lot of value very fast. Historically, the Mexican peso, the Latin Americans have lost value. The While I was working, the South African rand got massacred. And even though we only had a little bit of South, South African rand coming, we lost a lot of money. And our CEO, we briefed our CEO, and he went on CNN that day, and they talked about what a great quarter our company had, but except that our, the uh, South African Rand had hurt us, you know. And we had to prep him and talk about uh, why, because we were responsible for protecting us against that happening, and we weren't as well protected as we usually were. We got caught less protected than normal, and the Rand moved way more than normal. It happens, even to the best professionals. Fortunately, tiny, tiny portion of our all our foreign assets, very small one percent much less cryptocurrency is crazy but this is called here, here i'll just do my bullet points it's digital currency bitcoin was the first one most cryptocurrencies were created by individuals and are created by individuals and companies but not by governments but there are a few venezuela venezuela senegal tunisia and the marshall islands have issued their own cryptocurrency and they're becoming increasingly upset accepted but don't 
Don't think of them as money yet. You'll see why in a second. They have experienced an explosive and incredible increase in value at points, but they have also had unbelievable crashes. Like we, like I don't think I've ever seen, other than in a few historical situations where at one point, believe it or not, tulips. Tulips, there were some boats that were holding tulips off the shores of like England or France, and tulips went up in price because there was a shortage. And then they crashed, and people made money, and people lost money, and they're calling this the tulip asset bitcoins okay so they their volatility is so high and we, we look at risk later um, that they should be called kryptonite okay they're administered by something called a blockchain method and it was invented to create the first currency okay and here it is a blockchain is a network okay it's a process and it prevents counterfeiting and it it tries to ensure no individual takes control of the blockchain and it's there for verifi verification and security of the system. And it requires a group of computers, like each node in this drawing, okay? And it's called a distributed network that are all working in the blockchain. And here's what happens. Each time a crypto transaction happens, somebody buys something with crypto currency, the blockchain creates a random key. It's all programmed. And then a bunch of different people find, try to find that random key. So we got a bunch of people involved in this, right? And it's anonymous. They're called miners. And whoever deciphers the key first, they get to examine the transaction, approve the transaction, and put a stamp on it, so to speak, and they get paid for doing that. So in theory, this system protects from the blockchain being, let's call it abused. But when you see the way its price changed, changes, you got to think, uh, it's kind of not working, is it? Is it? You call it a currency, but its price is just swinging like crazy. So the blockchain isn't protecting it from swinging like crazy. So here we go. We have these miners. I didn't, don't look at the chart. Okay. It just serves to show you there are many, many miners. Okay. And people are tracking this. I don't know who any of these miners are. I haven't looked them up. This is a new chart I found. But there are massive crypto miner computer banks all over the world working 24 7, particularly in China. And it turns out they use so much electricity to do the mining that crypto values are being affected by the uh, electricity these guys pay to do the mining. Uh, mining okay they've already had technical issues business issues social issues hacking issues they've got problems but yet they're still out there people are still buying them some have been split or forked to create two uh currencies from one and one of them is maybe still the old currency and the new one is a new currency but you can't use it to buy and sell the old currency and it's created confusion but they're still out there okay and my big concern is this if you're creating an anonymous system isn't it very, very vulnerable to fraud or hacking? Because no one will know if it's all anonymous. You have these miners. Who, who are they, these miners, that get to join in this? Do they get vetted? Do they have good credit ratings? All right. So now we have a whole bunch of cryptocurrencies now. Okay. In, fun, in fact, so, some companies, to raise money, they're selling cryptocurrency. Okay. Instead of selling stock, they sell a cryptocurrency. And then they get that currency, and they use that currency uh, to buy money dollars so they can start their business right uh which is incredible <laughs> to me and the they're all being allowed to do this and the securities exchange commission thinks they're securities and our uh, cftc which regulates derivatives thinks they're derivatives so there's confusion still investment banks and hedge funds are i think oh, hedge funds are really into this i'm not sure i don't know enough yet uh investment banks have been in and out they've been jumping in and out they're looking at it real closely look at the price of bitcoin Okay, this is insane. Came out in September. Don't look at the, all those prices yet on the calendar there, the, uh, on the chart. Just look at the lines. In 2014, it came out at 457, and it went as high as 20,000 almost. Okay, uh, in 018, you see that when it goes really high, it dropped. In in uh, November 2018, uh, tremendously down to somewhere around 3,000 maybe 3,500, then it came back up in 019. I don't know why, right? 12,000, then it went down, now it's back up. And so the volatility is incredible. Now we can look at these numbers. The average yearly return though is 76%. That's unbelievably high, okay? Volatility is 73%. Now, believe it or not, average stocks have volatilities of that high. So it's outperformed a lot of stocks <clears throat> with the same volatility. Individual stocks are very risky, okay? And then the lowest it ever went was 178 in, Jan uh, in January of 2015. The highest it ever went was in 2017. So it made 280% annualized, okay, uh, from 2014 to 2017, from September 2014, 2017. That's incredible, okay? 
from the low or from when it started in 2014 to the high that's right 218 percent but from december 2017 to february 2018 it lost at a rate of almost 100 percent. it just crashed okay so that's scary and yet some people held on to their credit i met a gentleman tells me his son retired at 24. how trading bitcoin just retired 24 years old okay bitcoins have taken a spectacular roller coaster ride scary to me let's look at indexes Okay, not much to say about them. They're not directly traded, uh, but they are indirectly traded through futures contracts. Okay, and the indexes track the value of all kinds of things, stocks, bonds, commodities, real estate, everything. What you can do is if you think you want to bet on where an index is going to go, you can go find futures that, that are priced based on the index. Excuse me, like the S&P 500. That's very popular futures. Okay, so they're indirectly traded through futures and the futures is a derivative and the value can change way faster than the value of the index. Just like I keep saying, derivatives can change a lot faster than the underlying. So you got to know how to use fire to cook with fire. Okay. There are thousands of indexes, but there are only several hundred of futures contracts for key assets and key indexes, I should say. And most index trades really, I think, are done for hedging. And who? It's these large portfolio holders. If they have a big S&P 500, uh, portfolio or an optimal portfolio, they can use S&P 500 futures to quickly adjust the portfolio to behave like the S&P 500 when it gets out of balance. It's one method you can use, okay? That's that's called hedging, and hedging can be really intricate and complex, and people who know hedging are well-paid on Wall Street, okay? These are some of those really top-notch programmers and mathematicians who really understand the structure of markets extraordinarily well, okay. Um, but I would say uh, for the last bullet point, tra day traders do use them, but boy, look out if you're trading these indexes. If you just buy one contract, it can change price. Buy one contract against the S&P 500, 500 um, index can change 100 bucks every second, 200 bucks, 300 bucks. Uh, you can watch it go up $1,000 in 30 seconds and you're sitting there. And if you're not somebody who's comfortable taking a risk that you'll lose $1,000, don't touch them, okay? Because <laughs> you'll, you'll get blown away by these things, all right? But if you have a large, have a large uh, yeah, have a large portfolio worth many millions, then you don't mind uh, risking a thousand dollars to maybe make a couple of thousand dollars. And people do; they make their living trading these. All right, the roadmap we've already gotten through, all the way through investment types and earnings. Um, I really didn't get through earnings. There's more work to do on earnings, so I cheated saying that. Then we're gonna get into investment risk and portfolios. We're in an hour and a half. I think that I'm going to stop it here. I think what I'm gonna do is do a. Uh, follow-up show tomorrow so this will be part one and i'll do part two tomorrow because there's a lot of work so this was longer than i expected but i hope you feel like you learned learned a lot and i hope you'll come back for part two because an hour and a half is the length of a college class some call uh, classes meet three hours once a week but the typical college class is an hour and a half and we've worked hard for an hour and a half if you're here with me thank you i hope you're learning and i hope you'll keep coming back and i hope you'll go back to prior uh uh more alpha shows and remember there is an investing revolution and you can join it but also be careful right now because the market is so high it's time to go in with eyes open and really knowing what we're doing it's time to seek second opinions and it's not time okay if i can caution you for sitting and doing nothing if you have a portfolio it is not it's time for thinking through if your portfolio already has been um adjusted because you expect you expect the market to adjust they call it or to correct to go down good for you then you're ahead of the game um but if you have not then it's it's uh, this could be the most valuable thing i'm giving you is just the advice to go look, learn more and then make a decision all right el mora get more alpha show this was the third episode i had a great time preparing this one it is longer than i thought i probably have a half an hour more of slides here so tomorrow part two can be shorter um and we can see what the market does tomorrow we can get updated all right i will now get back to the streaming program and shut down. Thank you again from Carlsbad, California, Albert Mora. I'm always here for you. <laughs>